every player wants to develop. They want to have goals. They want to have something that they are striving towards to become the best version of themselves. The issue is not every player knows how to, number one, create effective goals, and then also create a plan in order to accomplish it. So this whole you know idea of, of having you know player development goals, having these benchmarks we're reaching for, it's great, but sometimes it can get a little messy with how you go about creating that plan. So today I'm just going to walk you through the main categories that I use when developing goals for players and then give you a glimpse into how you might want to program this and what this could look like to really make sure that you are pushing the needle forward on the things that you do think are important for their development. So if you look here at the top, we have goals. So this is a sheet that a player of mine that I work with would get where it would have their goals and it would also have you know, the, the plan in order to get there. What does their daily routine look like? What is their throwing? What is their drill work? What, is, what are their bullpens look like? So here at the top, I'm going to show you all the options essentially of how I like to think about this and how I bucket them. So the first category for goal setting is mechanical. So anything mechanics, right? Anything with the body. The second one is pitch development. So this is things like increasing velocity or improving the movement of a pitch. Then we have the third category, execution. So this is purely getting over the plate now. So this could be getting ahead, whether it's first pitch strikes or early in ahead. Maybe it's you know your usage of your pitches, just being able to optimize the way you're using your pitches and using that to your full advantage. It can really be anything that's over the plate and more of an execution command type focus. It could be an individual pitch even of, you know let's just say your fastball in zone percentage is low. Maybe your execution goal is increasing the fastball in zone. Then the last bucket that I like to use is CRG and mental game. So CRG is just controlling the running game and the mental game. It can be a very broad um, category. And these two categories, you know, they're not really the same, but I bucket them into one because usually not every player needs both of these goals. I would say that everyone has some sort of mental game goal that they probably should be working towards, but not everybody necessarily needs a controlling the running game goal because they might already be dialed in with holding runners. They might be quick to home and they might not really need to worry about that. So I'm going to go step by step about what some of these options are within this. So for mechanical, we can see I have an example here of, of what we can use, and I'll go through that here in a minute. But first, I want to show you all the options and the way I like to think about it. So from a mechanical standpoint, we have arm action. That could be a goal. We could have an arm slot goal. So maybe we're trying to lower the slot or we're trying to raise the slot, or maybe a guy's out of plane or rotation and we're trying just to get him back in plane. It could be back leg focus. It could be lead leg focus, and then it could be torso focus. So this could be just the way the upper body is rotating. There could be some nuance to this. Like these are pretty general categories, but you could get pretty messy if you start to literally have a goal category for everything that you can possibly think of. You could imagine the list would go on and on and on. So what I like to do is have more of a broad goal. Like what is the general area that we're trying to work on? And then below that, I have a question that says, what specifically? So we can dive into exactly what we need to accomplish. So in this case, I have back leg as the goal. And what specifically is, I'm trying to increase the back leg uh, flexion and the direction of that back leg load. So trying to get that guy to bend more, try to hinge better, a little bit deeper, as well as making sure the direction of that load is good. Because he could bend and get more flexion, but that doesn't mean that he's actually hinging at the hips. It could be that he's being pushed forward, but he's still getting a lot of flexion. So in this case, in this example, we want to make sure that we are gaining flexion, but we're also doing it in the right direction. Now for the pitch development goal. So this one's pretty simple. Um, there's only two categories. Velocity, this could be for any pitch type. Could be fastball or maybe it's a sp specific pitch like a slider or a cutter. Then we have a movement goal as a potential option as well. Once again, this could be for any pitch. So in this situation or this example, I have the goal specifically being to increase movement on the slider and to get it to have horizontal break of at least 10 inches or greater than 10 inches. Now moving on to execution. So this one, there could be a lot of options. So some ideas could be first pitch strikes, increasing that early and ahead. So for those that don't know what early and ahead is, I'll go through it real briefly. And early is any time the ball is put in play on three pitches or less, not counting 2-0. And ahead is any time you get to an 0-2 or a 1-2 count, regardless of what happens after that. And same with early, it doesn't matter if it's a hit or what happens. If the ball is put in play on three pitches or less, excluding 2-0, you get credit for an early. If you get to an 0-2 or a 1-2 count, you get credit for an ahead, regardless of what happens after that. You could strike him out, you could give a hit, you could walk the guy. Doesn't matter, you still get credit. So you add all those up and divide it by the batter's face. And that's how you get your early and ahead percentage. So average in the big leagues is about 72, 73%. So at the minimum, we want to be at 70%. 
Another option could be end zone. So just like I said before, maybe it's a specific pitch that you have to improve the end zone with. Maybe it's a fastball or a slider or a changeup, whatever it might be. And if you don't have end zone numbers, because end zone is different from strike percentage. So if you don't have access to, you know, an end zone data of track man or, you know, whatever it is, like if you're at the high school level, probably don't have this, or you definitely don't have this college level, some schools will, um, but you could also replace this with just increasing the strike percentage of a pitch. Pitch usage. So I talked about this a little bit ago. This could be, you know, trying to optimize the usage of your pitches. Maybe your best pitch is your slider and you're only throwing it 15% of the time. So the goal might be to increase it to 20 or 25%. The next one could be location. This is another option. So maybe you do a good job of throwing your fastball for a strike, but you're living, you know, middle, middle, and we need to get that more in or out or up, whatever you deem as the location that's going to optimize that pitch. You can get very specific with what quadrant of the zone or what half of the zone you're trying to go to with a pitch. And then we could get really specific with maybe it's a lefty or a righty issue. So we could go through platoon splits. Is it a lefty that I need to throw more strikes to? Is it a righty? And you can really break down exactly what that specific goal will be for a lefty or a righty. And the last one is CRG and mental game. So we have potential options is time to the plate. This would be a very common one for controlling the running game. Guys that are too slow trying to increase their time to home or make it faster. Another one could be improving your pickoff move. Maybe you have a really poor pickoff move and you need to have quicker feet or you need to have a better move as a lefty. Another one more general could be something fielding related. Maybe you really struggle with bunts or PFPs in some fashion that you really need to improve. Now, some of the mental side of the things could be pre-pitch routine. Just having a consistent pre-pitch routine can go a long ways. So you want to make sure that you're developing that and you have consistency with it. So it could be, I need to just create a pre-pitch routine because I don't have one, or it's, I just need to be more consistent with it and use it every single pitch. And the last category for this could just be the mental side, very broad. So I'll leave that to you on what specifically you think that person needs to improve. Maybe it's, you know, turning the page after a rough inning quickly and being able to stay focused in the present moment and not getting upset or showing bad body language. It could really be anything that you think is important that that player needs to improve. So now that we have our goals and we know how to organize these and how to break them down by each category. Now let's go through an example of how this could look. So like I said before, I created a goal for, as an example, for the back leg. So increasing back leg flexion and direction, pitch development, increase the slider horizontal break to 10 inches or more, execution, increase the early and ahead from 65 to 70%, and then a time to the plate goal of 1.3 or less. So it's great that we have goals, right? Like it's, it's great that we figured out what is the low hanging fruit for this player? What do we think is going to optimize his performance? But now the real work begins. Now we create a plan that helps us accomplish these goals. So first we want to know what is the throwing schedule? And this is, you know, obviously this is an off season. We can be very specific in season, a little bit different, but this is more of an off season approach where we're throwing two bullpens a week. So this is just a general layout bullpens, Monday, Friday, low days, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then a medium day on Wednesday, more of a work day. So we would have our warm up, mobility, dynamic warm up, our pre-throw arm care routine, pre-throw plyos. Um, so this is more for me, pre-throw plows is more of just to get the arm moving, more highly constrained drills here. We're not necessarily getting crazy high with the intensity, more so just patterning some stuff and getting us ready for throwing so that we don't waste throws when we start. We're actually ready to work on stuff and we don't have to start from 30 feet away. We can actually go into some meaningful throws. And then we want to break it down by category. So now we have our cash play routine. We, we see what our intensity and our rough distance is going to be on those low and medium days and bullpen days. Low days are super light. We're not going to focus on that, but let's focus on the medium and bullpen days. So in these medium and bullpen days, we're going to have a really good opportunity to work on our pitches, our mechanics, our time to the plate, as well as the execution goal. So this is really where the meat of that program is going to be. So on these medium days, we start with playing catch. You know, this is just a rough estimate of what someone might do going out to 90 to 120, 70 to 80% effort. At the end of catch play, a little bit of grip work, specifically with the slider, we want to work on the shape. So I would want this guy to be using a dot ball for that sweeper that's going to allow it to get 10 inches or more. And I will be educating that player and I would have you educate that player on where does that dot need to be when that ball is thrown so they're getting instant feedback in catch play. As we all know, guys in catch play, oh, they'll tell you the pitch is moving great, it looks awesome, their partner will tell them it's great, but you don't really know. And I think sometimes it doesn't carry over from catch play to the bullpen because you're misled on how it's actually moving. So having a dot ball just gives you instant feedback that's really helpful in catch play to know if you're moving in the right direction. And then we would go into after catch play and we did our 
our spin work with the slider. We would then do some drill work on the mound. So maybe we're doing a posterior step back to foot plant. So I won't show you what this looks like, but it's more of a loading drill, non-throwing. You're holding a medicine ball or a water bag, and you're focusing on that initial move into that load into foot plant. No actual throw, no rotation, just that first initial move. Then there could be a water back series where we're starting to focus on more of that loading pattern with a little instability, and maybe adding a rotational aspect to it, still no throwing. And then we'll finish up with a couple throws. So the first one could be a step back. This could be a traditional step back where you're stepping back towards second. It could be a step back um, posteriorly. So if I'm a righty stepping back towards first base, if I'm a lefty stepping back towards third base to help that pattern of loading back behind me in that direction of that load. So this is more of a direction more than anything. So maybe you do four throws with the red ball. I like to usually go a little bit overload on medium days um, just so that the arm isn't moving crazy fast and we make sure we're keeping that intensity fairly low. But this can be flexible. If a guy responds better to more of the five ounce plyo, that's perfectly fine. Definitely probably want to do underload work on a medium day. So keep it you know, around, around a five ounce plyo ball or a little bit heavier like a seven ounce. After that drill, if we're going to work on that flexion, a single leg hop throw could be a great option because we're going to jump up. We're going to have to absorb that force, which is going to force us to get a little bit of flexion in that back leg as we're driving towards home. So that could be a really good drill to work on that. Then we go on to a bullpen day. So bullpen day, very similar to the medium day. We stretch it out a little bit further, higher intensity. At the end of catch play, a little bit of grip work. Once again, using the dot ball with the slider to make sure that it is spinning the way we want it to. And then I like to do plyos on the mound before the bullpen as well. Now, the in, the volume will, will be lower, but I definitely want to prime some of those movements before we get into our bullpen session. So it'll be the same drill package, just the ball usage and the volume is going to be a little bit different. And then we would move on to the bullpen. And this is where we can really start to work on a lot of, a lot of different things. So you could do this multiple ways. You could do it to where you're working on you know everything in one bullpen. I probably want it suggest that just because you're not going to get a lot of meaningful reps on one thing. It's just going to be a little bit of everything, which might not push the needle. So what I would do is, you know, let's just say a Monday bullpen, we're focused on that slider. The whole session, it's a pitch design session and we are dialed in on that slider. Doesn't mean we don't throw other pitches. In fact, I would suggest that you do throw other pitches because we want to make sure that we are slowly adjusting a pitcher to that extra volume with a pitch. Because if we're trying to increase the horizontal break on something or increase the movement on any pitch, we're going to be trying some things. We're going to be doing different things, maybe with the hand and with the body as we're throwing. And the body might not be ready for the stress that's going to be put on it with some of those different positions. So we want to make sure that we're careful not to overload too much. So I usually like to be around 30 to 40% usage of whatever that new pitch is that we're trying to develop. So in this case, a 25 pitch bullpen or a 24 pitch bullpen, maybe I'm throwing 10 sliders, nine sliders, eight to 10 sliders, somewhere in there, just to really make sure that we are slowly cooking them um, and making sure we're not overdoing it as we're getting them used to this. So now we'll go to, sorry, this is freezing on me a little bit. So now I'll show you just an example of this. So we might go a couple of fastballs, three sliders, a couple of fastballs, a couple of sliders, and then we could alternate just to get them used to not throwing it multiple times in a row, just like they might in a game. And then we'll mix in a changeup or whatever their third pitch is. If they have a fourth pitch, you'll have to add that in it somewhere. But really just slowly cook them into getting it a little bit more randomized, right? Early on in the bullpen session, we might want to feel it. We're trying to get something. So we might throw three in a row, two in a row. But eventually, we want to make it a little bit more randomized to make sure that we are pushing the needle forward and that we're able to do this, not just when we're feeling it over and over again, but actually more game-like to where we throw a different pitch in between and maybe go two pitches without throwing it. Now, I'm going to reload this real quick because it's a little fuzzy right now for some reason. There we go. That's better. Okay. So like I said, goal is 10 inches of horizontal breaker more on this pitch. And what we want to do is we want to track that. If you're using TrackMan or whatever you're using, obviously you have to use something to measure this specifically. I would suggest TrackMan over Rapsodo just because it's going to be a little bit more accurate with the movement numbers. So let's just say this is a five-week block that you're working on this pitch. For all the sliders here in this slider horizontal break week one, put how much horizontal break there was. Every time he throws a slider, put it in there. And then at the bottom, you can put what the average was. You'll do that for five weeks, and then you'll be able to see the progression over time of whether it improved, didn't improve, what worked, what didn't work. You could even have a note section down here that where you write down some of the cues or grips that worked for them so that he makes sure that he remembers them and continues to use them. If you have a track man, like I said, you probably do if you're doing this type of stuff, it will be saved in there. But this is just kind of a simpler way for you just to make sure or be able to see it on one page what's going on with that slider and how the progression looks. 
So now let's look at a Friday bullpen. So this could be a bullpen where we are focusing more on the execution. So maybe it's we're working on our early and ahead of 70%, and we're also working on our time to the plate of one, three, or less. So early and ahead only requires three pitches in order to achieve it, right? So it's a ball in play on three pitches or less, which in a bullpen setting, there's not a ball put in play. So we're mainly focused on the ahead version, which is getting to either an 0-2 or a 1-2 count. So what I would suggest is doing three pitch at-bats, alternating between a righty and a lefty. If you have a real batter, awesome, put them in there. If not, a dummy will work perfectly. And then you could just circle, you could print this out and just circle a B for ball, S for strike, and you'll be able to count up at the end how many early and aheads did he get. So we can see here, let's just say the first one, he threw ball, ball, strike, that would not count as an early and ahead. Next one, he goes strike, strike, ball, that would count. Next one, strike, 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 that would count. Next one, all three balls, that would not count. So add them all up. And then every week you can add in here and see what his progression is on how well is he doing with early and ahead. So here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have eight of them. So four lefties, four righties. So he's facing eight batters a week. So over time, you know, after these five weeks, that's 40 at bats, that's four simulated at bats. And we can see, is he trending in the right direction or not? So this just gives you a general layout of how you could do this, right? Like these bullpens can be structured multiple different ways, but this is just a way that I like to think about it. Um, I think it makes things a little bit more simpler on you as a coach when you have goals bucketed, because let's face it, if we're bouncing around from one thing to the next and we don't have a clear plan, the player is not going to make progress. And if they do, it's going to be really, really difficult to replicate it. But the more things that you're tracking, the more things that are system systematized, <laughs> trying to find the word for that tough word to say for me, um, the more we're able to do that, the easier it's going to be to track and figure out what worked, what didn't work. And if something did work, we keep doing it. And maybe we can try that with another player. If it didn't work and if we try that with multiple players, maybe that's something that just doesn't work. And when you're not tracking things, it just can be difficult to know, you know, what the best solutions are for, for each category. So I love your guys' feedback. I'd love to know, you know, which one resonated with you, um, what things you liked, didn't like, and, and maybe share some of your ideas if you have your own development plan.